Oh, episode seven of Milk and Bourbon. Um, I'm here with my all-time greatest best friend, Nick Cataldo. Um, I will allow him to introduce himself, but first we're going to treat you to um, my birthday workout, which if you watch this thing, it was, it was a slog through and through. So enjoy the workout. Um, we'll see you in a few. All right, so check it out. Me and Nick Cataldo decided to do something stupid um, for my birthday. I actually got inspired by Nick Cataldo. He, uh, he did something similar on his 31st birthday. So we're um, doing a hex bar deadlift 365 for 31 reps. We're splitting it up. And after each set of four, um, we're going for a mile run, which will total to seven and three quarters miles, which on a track would be 31 laps. And then, provided that we haven't broken ourselves off by that point, we've got a final finisher workout to uh, do for you guys. Um, rocking the six pack ranch shirt, go check that out. It's my buddy Adam Hall's podcast, but this should be a good time. Maybe. Uh, enjoy the rest of the podcast. 
Um, me and Nick talk about some pretty cool stuff. It's definitely interesting, and I'd love to hear your take on it. Peace out. So, episode seven of Milk and Bourbon. Um, I was gifted a book to read among three others, or two others, excuse me, by my friend Nick Ataldo. And uh, we got to discussing the book and realized that this would be a great opportunity for us to have a podcast together. Um, the, the book is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor and just so happened to be a psychotherapist as well. And his book is kind of split into two parts. The first part is the experience um, of Dachau and Auschwitz. And then the second part, part is him explaining his psychotherapy called logotherapy and um, I guess the, the meaning of man's life and what drives them to do certain things or how they find satisfaction, I guess. Um, and it, it's kind of a direct contradiction to um, like the Jung's and the Freud's before him. So we will get to that first. I'm going to give Nick an opportunity to um, explain, you know, how he got to this point in his life, what kind of person he is. And um, just so you guys have a better opportunity to understand where he's coming from versus where I'm coming from. Hey, Nick, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on your show, man. I'll, I'll first just say thanks. I'm very humbled to to sit and talk with you, you know, and after, as I guess we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, we've known each other a long time. Yeah. Uh, I'm proud to see you sitting here doing this, and uh, I've really enjoyed listening to your content. Again, respect everything you've been doing with this show and, and with your life thus far that, that you've shared with me. Uh, so, Nick, uh, I grew up in a town called Jupiter, Florida, outside of West Palm Beach for most of my life. Uh, Left at 18 to go to the academy where, where we met, the Air Force Academy. Been in the Air Force the last 13 years. Um, married to Brittany, whom Nick knows uh, extremely well, too. We all you know, yeah. met each other around the same time. Two children who just ran out of the house so that we could have some... Uh, young, <laughs> young children and yeah. rambunctious at that. Yes. So Holy cow. Brittany, thankfully, brought them out of the house so that the... Podcast wouldn't be continually interrupted with <laughs> popsicle sticky hands and, yep. and, and pee pee noises. <laughs> uh, right now, I'm just living in North Carolina, so yep. happy to be living next to you right now. Yeah, so he mentioned it, he touched on it. We we met um, in what I would describe as hell. Um, <laughs> it, it was no Auschwitz. No, it was, it was it no bad. Auschwitz, but it, I mean, I wasn't having a good time straight up. Um, we t we'll talk about attitudinal. Um, meaning. It's one of the three that Viktor Frankl mentions, and I have still not quite mastered it, so I definitely didn't have it mastered at 18. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about is just like a couple a couple of stories. Um, and before I do that, I'm probably going to throw up some pictures of like the Nick Cataldo and, and the Brittany Schweck. Now, yeah, now Brittany Cataldo. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw some pictures of the, the Brittany and the Nick that I knew in 2008 it's a very funny the one picture that i'm thinking of is i don't think they'd even spoken to each other yet but they were starting to we were going through basic and they were both looking a little rough so i'm definitely gonna have you thrown little pictures on the show before of how you looked no in 2008 i looked handsome yeah. I, had, I mean the boyishly handsome not, yeah. the, not the handsome man you yeah, had now, i looked like a you child you gotta throw some up there i look like a child all right so i'll throw like some um Billy Song took yeah. some pictures one time in our in our dorm room. I, I guess you can call it a dorm room. It was more of a barracks. Anyways, um, there are some pictures of me looking a little rough. So, yeah, I'll throw those up too. Fine. That's fair. That's fair. But, um, yeah, my, my first interaction, like really true interaction that I can remember from 2008 was, um, what was it, wing staff or squad, squadron staff? Group staff. Group people. staff. I, yeah. So, um, I hadn't come to the Air Force Academy as a polished product. Um, I like to joke that Nick's been forty since he was about fifteen, <laughs> and so he's finally growing into that age now. We're getting towards it. Um, but he was already. I mean, he knew who he was. I don't think I quite did, and it showed. And I became. I would say. I don't, this isn't a, you know, the world centered on me, but I definitely felt like I was the lightning rod. Yeah, you took, uh, you took the brunt of the pain yeah. on behalf of everybody else. You're the yeah. sacrificial lamb, unfortunately, a yeah. lot of times. So I got called up, and this was a, a traumatic event. It almost seemed like the world didn't want me to tell that story, but we went up to 
what was it again? Group staff. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I was just getting wrecked. But before that happened, our cadre were asking if there'd be any volunteers, any volunteers to go um, to go up there with me because you you couldn't go alone. And I think Nick eventually was like, fuck it, man. Like, yeah, I'll go do it. Sure. Fine. Obviously, no one else is stepping up. Nick Catalo, he's going he's gonna to save the day. Well, he was the worst possible person to go up with me. Because he was a forceful character even at 18. Knew himself. Was confident. I was not at the time. I had been badly beaten in a, in a psychoanalyst type of way by that point. So... I go up there and they're having us yell and Nick's just got the command voice again, 15 going on 40. He had grown man voice already. I was still working on it and they were like, why can't you be more like Cataldo? And I was like, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying, but it was a traumatic experience for me and, and Nick, that was my first experience with him was him stepping up when there were 30 other people that could have stepped up. And yeah, you're not kidding. It did. There was a good pause and the whole time my initial reaction was, I don't want to that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to go sit there. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it sucks. And uh, man, I still feel bad to this day. Like a wiser, more mature me, like because I was still figuring it out too, would have recognized like, okay, this is not the time. To, this is the time to like be on the same level so that you can share the heat, not try to get out of it yourself. So man, I'm sorry, but uh, I mean, you stepped up. It I just know. took you a second. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, man, that was the beginning of our friendship. So it yeah. was uh, one of the better decisions I've I've made. Kind of, I guess it kind of leads into the book. I don't want to jump ahead of you, but it's like no, those things it. where it's like when things are going to be hard. Like usually, it's a good idea to to, to just buck up and, and do your best, uh, you know, and step forward into it because you never know what the the upsides are going to be out of it. I mean, one of the upsides of of that decision to volunteer, even when I didn't want to, was like our friendship and the thirteen years that uh, it's been solidified since then. So. Totally worth yeah. a little bit of yelling and some shitty food and some guy with a square jaw. Super square. Face. Super square. Yeah, fuck that guy in his square jaw. Yeah. He's too handsome. <laughs> and I know he used hair product every morning. <laughs> that was not natural. Um, yeah, so, I mean, since I left the Air Force Academy during our sophomore year, went on to the University of Kentucky, um, you know my story. He stayed on, gritted his teeth, and, and, and bore his way through it. And uh, he's been very successful in his Air Force career. Um, a lot of the things that he's done kind of, I was, it was like, um, what's the word, like the, the spark for me in my career. I was seeing him accomplish amazing things and I wanted a part of the action. So a lot of the accomplishments I have in my career, which there are a few, are always because like I've seen someone do it before me. So appreciate that, man. Like, well, likewise. Always like, fun to yeah see, and he and you'll never know that he has accomplished something unless Brittany mentions it because he doesn't <laughs> talk about himself. He never he never does. And in fact, when I asked him to do a brief introduction for this podcast, he was like, "Brittany, come in here and tell me who I am." Because <laughs> well, part of that is it's just like she'll give you a no shit answer. She yeah, knows, she knows all my flaws better than anybody else. Yeah. to try to give you a fair accurate answer very true i mean she knows both of us pretty damn well yeah yeah so we like i said Brittany was a friend of all of ours at the same same time and part of a, a close group and when you go through and i think i'm not sure how much he touches on this in the book but there is something about friendships forged during a shared hardship um like my two best friendships stemmed from that experience at the air force academy um Shout out to you, Cody. I know you're not going to watch this, you little bastard, but he's too busy. Yeah. Just yeah. Enjoy. He just got out. Um, very civilian. I don't know if he's even working yet. I know he's got a job lined up. He better not be, man. He better be sitting in tan and enjoying it. I think he that's is. That's what I would be doing. I think he is. So he, um, he's in Texas now? Yeah. Yeah, so the three of us was a friendship. It was a friendship forged through... I mean, I've been through some pretty tough schools... Um, in the army and I've told everyone ever since just with the timeline of it how it was lined up to where I was in my maturity level yeah nothing touches that first year at the Air Force Academy like ranger school 
what I the selections that yeah, I've been you through. Were better prepared for those. I was yeah. I had the maturity and the grit that I did not have when I was eighteen. You had the vision and purpose too. Yeah. So. Yeah, I wish he mentioned that more. He didn't mention that's the one gripe I have about his the anecdotal part of his book was he didn't talk too much about relationships except mm-hmm. for one time when um, things got really bad in Dachau, really bad, and I think they were they were being deprived of just like essential like down even the normal like bread and daily allowance that they got was diminished because I think the war was grinding to a halt and so Germany was reallocating everything. So these guys were going through a particular tough time and like the room leader um, <clears throat> in the shacks that they lived in asked him to, to talk to everyone in the darkness because they weren't even they didn't even have electricity at this point. They were just laying down in darkness. They didn't have the strength to stand up. They didn't have the strength to do anything. <clears throat> and someone finally asked uh, Dr. Frankel to try to help out the men because the, the, the feeling in the room was that they were going down a dark path and that yeah. there was going to be some suicides. And he talked about that, that, attitudinal me- or that attitudinal meaning that we've spoken of. So there's three ways that you can find meaning in your life according to Dr. Frankel. It's the creative, it's the experiential, and then it's the attitudinal. So obviously these guys weren't able to be creative. Um, Dr. Frankel was a writer. He was working on a book and they took it from him. Um, it wasn't experiential beyond, like they would stop and look at sunrises sometimes and that was a beautiful moment for them. But like aside from that, man, like they weren't getting much from their experiences and it, then it's just based off of how you react. Mm-hmm. Like your mindset, regardless of what's happening to you, is going to dictate your meaning, like how you can find your meaning, right? Yeah, I, I think... You know, a lot of a lot of authors have tried to essentially lay out some of the lessons that Frankel laid out, uh, just in less than ideal conditions. I mean, we were talking about Goggin's book, you know, "Can't Hurt Me." You, you talk about things like extreme ownership, where it's like it's up to you to determine your attitude and how you face things, and it's there's meaning to be found, and those are all well and good. And you know, Ranger School is hard. I've, you know, done a few things that were not necessarily comfortable at the time, but when you when you think about the conditions. Um, that, that people faced in, in these concentration camps and doc, and this isn't the only book that talks about uh, just the, the vile conditions and things these people had to experience is you, you can't you can't help but recognize like this is probably the worst thing imaginable that a, that a human being could go through and uh, if you can if this guy can recognize and hold true to the same lessons that some of these other authors talk about you can't help but bring validity to their to their to their beliefs and their opinions. That it has to be true. If it can withstand that, it would be able to withstand anything. Yeah. Yeah, so I was actually... I'm looking over our notes as, as you spoke, and um, I've, I have a book that's a, a collection, really, of Friedrich Nietzsche's like best quotes, best ideas, um, and the man can get pretty dark a lot of times mm-hmm. and I mean it gets it's borderline like neurotic mm-hmm. like it's, it's yeah. really tough to read some of the things he, because he, he looks at things so matter of factly that he kind of eliminates the emotion from things mm-hmm. um, but in this certain quote that um, Dr. Frankel uses and this is something that Dr. Frankel kind of hung some of his principles on was that he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how and in fact I highlighted it in the book that you gave me <laughs> Um, underlined it, I think. And he who has any why to live for can bear any how. So that was another thing that when I read that quote, I remembered that Dr. Frankel also mentioned that by and large, the people that survived had someone or something waiting for them. Yes. So they had something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. So it was either that that relationship with their wife and children mm-hmm. That, that book that Dr. Frankel was writing, he, he knew that he couldn't die because he knew he had something to accomplish on the outside yeah. getting out of it. And I think that's something super powerful about that too. Yeah, he, I mean, I think it's in the book. Uh, he actually had the opportunity to escape the camps. Obviously, you could never fully know what would wait for you at the camps. And you know, history has taught us the, the, the shock and awe of, of what the reality was when people got there off, of, off the trains and all that. But he, he knew something was coming. 
uh, for the Jews in, in, in Austria. And he had an opportunity to escape, I believe, to America. Uh, but he didn't want to leave yeah. his family behind. Yeah. And um, I think he even had opportunities to, to leave the camp prior to, to escape in some fa- uh, fashion. Uh, but he, he looked at the camps as, as an opportunity to essentially test his theory. So he had had this, this logotherapy built up you know, prior to the war in a, in, a, in a peacetime environment. And he thought to himself, like, man, if there was ever an environment in which to like, battle test this theory, like, this is it. So this guy willingly so extreme. threw himself into the camps in order to find out if, uh, if his theory was right. And the shit, he, he maintained true to that the entire time and ended up publishing this book. I think, didn't, you said they took the book, didn't he? Like, he ended up rewriting it he re- on, like, and toilet paper or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so he started, yeah, he had, like, some sort of, like, wax paper mm. from, like, something. Because they, they ended up giving him, because he was, he got to be so weak that he couldn't do physical labor anymore. But mm. he he was, I guess, valued enough by the Germans that were running the camp and his fellow prisoners that like they wanted to keep him alive because he had been helping he was an incredibly smart individual obviously so they they put him into like the pack house or something that's like, right that's he was right. distributing um food or whatever and so he took some of this wax paper and he started rewriting the whole thing and he kept that throughout his whole experience at the at these camps which i think i mean when you were saying like he it was kind of voluntary that he was like, I could have easily gotten out. Um, there were many prominent doctors and because everyone's trying to ma- manage their talent as far as a nation goes. So the United States was accepting like all the scientists, every doctor, like come, come to us, we'll, we'll house you and you can start a better life here with us. And it was, a, I mean, it was really just, they were trying to increase the talent pool for math and science in the U.S., which I don't disagree with. But he... He had that opportunity and instead was like, this is the best. I think this is, um, I, I would never just be like, I believe in this theory so much that I'm going to put myself through immense pain for years. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine that, making that decision. Um, I mean, we, we were joking about the decision to go to a lunch table where you're going to be fed and you knew you were going to leave in 30 minutes is a brave yeah. decision. I mean, this man walked into a situation where he didn't know if he would come out alive uh, voluntarily and... What a, what a leap of faith uh, to, to have that and to recognize that that was worth his, his life. And it he goes on after experiencing all of this and there was that video where he's he's being interviewed and it looks like it's in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he's advanced in his years at this point. And he was saying that people that have the harder lives, whether it's social, socioeconomic, or... Otherwise, like classism, whatever, people that have those tougher lives should feel bad for the people that didn't have, didn't experience any strife yeah. because now they're far less likely to have like initiative or interest in anything to improve the world because they've, they have, they don't see the need. They don't, they've got all the money in the world or all the yeah. free time in the world and they, they seek that pleasure that, um, Freud was always so adamant about talking about and, Frankel was like, those guys, those people will never experience true happiness or true like fulfillment mm-hmm. because there's nothing to fulfill. They, they've got these empty lives, right? And so he was saying that like by going through this experience that – and I've, I can kind of see what he's talking about actually. By going through this incredibly tough experience, he was able to appreciate the smaller things in life afterwards. So like – and he knew what he was driving for because when you're constantly broken down – you get broken down to your basic building blocks and your basic like, yeah. um, what's the word, interests and and loves yeah. and passions. You get down to the core of who you actually are. So then you can just focus on that afterwards. Yeah. You don't. You don't get. I mean, I think about it like this way: like, how good did a half decent meal taste after you finished ranger school? After you'd been deprived of food yeah. for. 60 days and you know you lost what 20 or 30 pounds or something like that yep. like the the sweetness of the the simple pleasures in life is like you ha- really have to juxtapose that with some really trying times in order to to fully appreciate those for what it's worth and i actually have a quote from from frankel that I, that i keep on me 
is one of my favorite of his, and I, I love this book. And what, I guess the reason why we're talking about it now, but one of my favorite quotes is, "For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued; it must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself, or as a byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself." And I, I, what that means to me is, you know, we hear so much in our society today. I, we hear it from parents. I hear other parents say it about their kids. Like, I just want my kid to be happy. I just want my, my kid to be happy. Like, happiness is all that matters. If you're happy, that's all that, that's all that we should really be seeking. And, and I, I think so many people are, are distraught in today's modern era where we have all these things that we've never had before. And life is easier than it's always been. And we've, we've been pleasure-seeking for so long. We're, we're so intelligent. We're so advanced that we're able to get all the things that we, get, that we wanted. And it hasn't brought us the happiness. And I think the reason behind that is because of what Frankel says is like happiness is is not a goal to be attained it it, it happens when you're actually putting in genuine effort genuine work and the the three ways that Frankel and I agree with him uh, theorizes that you do that is by finding a purpose outside of oneself you know whether that be this podcast for you gives you some some purpose or you know people love to to write or to serve others or uh, you know to build something with their hands and then to have a relationship, and I, I think, well, he doesn't explicitly talk too much about friendship there. To recognize that like um, human beings are a social creature, and that to to give oneself in one form or another uh, to benefit another purpose it is a, is a meaningful pursuit. And then ultimately, the, the probably the crux of his book is the that suffering to find the suffering and the uh, the attitudinal. I believe is the the way you, you phrase it. Like suffering is going to happen. Even mm-hmm. the people that have all the things that you would, you know, they have all the boats, all the money, they're suffering. They'll find a way to suffer. Yeah, yeah you will find, we will all find a way to suffer. I mean, we were, it's like 75 degrees in here mm-hmm. and we were complaining about how hot it is right <laughs> now. Like, like we, <laughs> you know, we, we're not that tough apparently. Yeah. Like we need to embrace that suffering and recognize <laughs> it's part of life. And like, that's part of the, the joy of living life is you take the good with the bad and that suffering will ultimately, you know, when you get a chance to, hang out with a friend and have a, have a cold drink or be around your loved ones. It's, it's all a much more meaningful. Have you heard of, um, and this, this ties into what you were just saying, cause you were talking about, um, how people, it's not the, the goal. It's not the end state. It's the, the experience leading up to it. Have you, yeah. yeah. Have you heard of something called a rival fallacy? No. So it's, it's, it's been defined. It's basically the, the inherent sadness that comes when a person um, reaches a huge milestone, hmm. like when you've when you've been fighting, you know, tooth and nail, yeah, to get through whatever you like. You set a goal years down the line, five yeah. years down the line, and everything, every little step that you do, kind of has that end state mm-hmm. in mind. And then you get there, and you're like, now what? Because what's happened yeah. is through that process you've attached your identity mm-hmm. to that pursuit and then now that the pursuit is over you feel like you've lost a part of yourself and that's called the rival fallacy i did not know that yeah and so it's it like it fed into like when you ask somebody what they do mm-hmm. they actually don't tell you what they do they tell you who they are mm-hmm. so hey what do you do i'm a doctor mm-hmm. it's not that they heal people they're healing people yeah but they they answer they're a doctor or what do you do? I'm a writer. Yeah. They they're not talking about publishing books. They're talking about me as a person. I my identity is Nick Rogers the writer. Yep. And you you reach that point where you're like fuck I'm here. Yeah. This thing that I've been striving for all my life or for for the, for the past five years or decade has suddenly been accomplished. And there's that initial high. You're like fuck yeah I'm proud mm-hmm. of myself. And then you're like damn what do I do next? Yeah. And so. It, Kind of what you were talking about was the people that already have, they basically reach the end state of what America Mm -hmm. society is telling them is Mm -hmm. the end state. Like, no wonder they have so many issues. The famous rich people Mm -hmm. have all these issues that they go through. Like, for instance, like, there's a lot of problems with children of very famous people because those children are born into it. They didn't work for that fame. And then there's like there's the twenty seven club. Miley Cyrus, yeah, Cyrus of the world. But the yes, or the or the, um, I mean, there's any number. There's a 20, whole twenty seven club. There's like 
eight or nine like very famous people that have died at 27 because of drug overdoses. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I cannot see what you're saying. I didn't know it was a rival fallacy, and I, I think we see it all the time. I think athletes are a good, um, a good population of people to see that in. Mm. Somebody was telling me a story the other day about Deion Sanders, so like one of the most athletic people of our time. Right? Mm. He was a pro football player and baseball player at the same time. I, I'm going to butcher some of the facts, but it will get the point across, which was that he was essentially playing in a World Series and a Super Bowl yep. within the same week. And uh, I think he ended up being the MVP of the Super Bowl and like hit a home run in the World Series or something like that. Like The two pinnacles mm-hmm. of, you know, of athletics in the U.S. And, and some would say the world. And after doing that that week, like he either thought about or attempted suicide in his hotel room. That's crazy. That like that week. So you, you think about that and you're like, oh my God, this guy has everything to live for. Like he's reached the top. I mean, most people, point, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people could never play in the professional league. You and I certainly couldn't. And this guy was able to make it into two of like of those elite leagues. And he gets there and he realizes like I'm unhappy because all they knew was the pursuit, which I think is admirable. Like the people that continually grind, like my hats off to you and respect to that. Um, but when you tie your identity only to that pursuit, like one of the everything's going to be taken from us mm-hmm. one way or another. Like nothing is nothing is infinite. It's always going to be gone. And I think about that often. Like my my limited experience with that was like when when I got hurt and couldn't box anymore. I went into a pretty pretty heavy depression or what I consider to be a heavy depression. Right. Like for for myself, we never we, talked about that. By the way, it just kind of happened and. Yeah, man, I, I didn't really know what to make of it, and I guess kind of like most things, you don't really know how to, you don't really understand the lessons that came from it or what you know God's putting you through it in while you're in the midst of it. But like I had tied myself and identified, yeah, as as a boxer for so long, like you know never professional level or anything like that. But I, I was you were a great proud boxer, of, yeah, good enough to be a decent you know collegiate or amateur. So yeah. something that I took pride in, and when it was gone, I was like, well, shit, yeah. When somebody asks, you know, like. What do you do? Like, oh, I'm a boxer. Well, now you don't do that anymore. That's taken from you. And that's a lesson that I've taken from that is like, if what I'm doing right now is taken from me tomorrow, would I be able to continue on? Like whatever role I'm fulfilling, whether that be as, you know, in the military or as a father, as a, as a husband, as a friend, like what I'm able to do physically with my body. Like if I got into a car wreck tomorrow and became a paraplegic, mm-hmm. like, how would... And all the physicalities, like, and you would have to relate to this, like, you, your physical abilities play a large role into who you are as a person, right? Yeah. Like, how do how would you prepare for that mentally to continue on? I don't know if you can. I think you can generally, yeah, work on your resilience mm-hmm. and just your mental toughness. Mm-hmm. But like, how do you? Yeah. How how do you prepare for I, that kind of loss? I I the forewarned is forearmed. I guess. I mean, I. I've made a commitment that to myself anyway that like well whatever as long as there's air in my lungs and my heart's beating like I'll endure whatever God puts in front of me because that's and this is what Frankel gets to in his book a little more secular about it a little less about God yeah. but he is definitely there I mean he's a religious man uh, and that you know like God is putting you through that for a reason and it would be disrespectful not to live up to the challenge placed in front of you and yeah it, even though you know like I still, I don't feel good about it. Like yeah, if I was a paraplegic, I'm like yeah, I could crush that. I could be no problem. That would be right. no like that would be the that would be maybe the worst thing that I could think of to happen to my to my physical person. But mm-hmm. it's like you have to find a way uh, to work through that suffering and, and find. I mean, look at Stephen Hawking, like the, one of the most brilliant minds of our time. Like God, if he doesn't walk, like you mean to tell me that you can't offer something just because you can't move your arms and feet. Yeah. And he, yeah he's, he's out there exploring the cosmos and stuff, yeah. giving us information that we would have never, the theory of everything. Mm-hmm. Like he's tying together. Have you ever tried to read, like, I know this is completely off topic, but I mean, it's my, good. Sh- it's my show. Yeah. Um, have you ever tried to read like through string theory or like M theory or multiverse theory or any of that? Uh, a little bit of Einstein's stuff, I guess. Would it, would it be accurate to say like yeah, he's kind of the sure. father of string theory? In the quantum mechanics, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, but it's one of those where it's like I hear it 
or I think it, and then I grasp it for a second, and then it's gone. and then I think <laughs> about it for more, and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, it floated away. Like, uh, fairly smart guy. They, those people like that, that can really uh, sit in the moment, stay in the pocket on those ideas, are just on a different level. I just don't know, like, who who was the? I mean, this is a quick Google search away, but like, who was looking at a, a fermion and going, oh, this has to only operate in ten dimensions, like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> dial it back a few degrees, sir. Here, bud. I don't know. You made that connection somehow in your brain, but there's about 15 different things that I'm missing out on. And I'm not gonna lie to you. Whatever the word was, you say like I don't even know what the hell that is. Fermions, so, yeah, fermions. You're they're they're like that. particles. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> you like the 10 dimensions thing. Like oh, I can count to 10, even though that sounds crazy, but I don't even know what those are. And then they're trying. Yeah, so yeah, for people like. To try to bring us back just because like I can I can go down that path for a long time. I really could. Okay. Just because it's it doesn't make sense to me and so I like having my own mind blown. But for people like Stephen Hawking, yeah, who have everything taken I mean, what was he like twenty I think he was twenty three when he found out. Oh man, yeah. Yeah. So prime of his life realizes that and then they were saying that his his prognosis, they were saying that he wasn't gonna live more than a decade or something. And he lived into like his seventies, right? Yeah, I mean, Some, he, he was old. He was an old man. He died yeah. of natural causes, yeah. which is amazing. Um, but for him to like have that taken away from him, um, and to have just to kind of tie it together, I wanted to to end on this final point, um, and it's how do you prepare yourself? And this is dark, but like I think there's. I think there's some utility in thinking about it from time to time because I, I mentioned before the podcast that I had thought about it and I came up with like not a savory answer, mm -hmm. but how do you prepare yourself for death? Or like if, if you were to like know that you're facing death in a, you know, you have three months to live, six months to live. It happens all the time to yeah. a ton of people. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you respond to that? Um, and I said that, and this is going back to that, attitudinal meaning like if you know in the moment that mortality has suddenly become a very real thing for you it, it's real for everyone but i feel like the human mind it's hard to fathom it's so basis. hard to fathom man yeah. and like if you're religious or not like just the idea like of dying and leaving this plane mm -hmm. is crazy and it's and then it's even more pronounced sometimes if like I have, I'm kind of in a, in a place where I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. So yeah. like, I also entertain the idea of what if it just ends Yeah. and like, that's just it. Yeah. And that's, a, that's crazy to me too. Like it's just over. So like preparing yourself for that and like knowing and tying it back to Viktor Frankl, um, that question was asked of him in like that 88, 89 video mm -hmm. that I, I showed you and, um, he was asking, like, how do you find meaning knowing that, like, your time is coming, maybe mm -hmm. at an untimely, yeah. in an untimely manner? And he was like, um, the past isn't lost, it's stored forever. Mm -hmm. and, and he kind of went into, like, a butterfly effect type thought where your, even your small choices, like me choosing to come over here and have this chat with you, mm -hmm. like, that will have some sort of lasting effect in a weird way. And, it, and it's created this path that we would not have gone down had I not chosen to come, come mm -hmm. over, right? And he was saying, like, for you to think that it's an untimely event is kind of... Egocentric. Yeah. Yeah, it's, e it's like, egotistical of you to think. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm one of those people. Like, we, I feel like I have so much more to offer. We all are. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard for anybody to let go of their self to be like, well, it's my time. Yeah. I, I, and I think Frank would say, like, if you were told you have three months to live tomorrow... He would say to that person who might be initially stunned, I know I would be, mm -hmm. would be a little, you know, wall in self pity a little bit. Well, what a what a gift to know that you have three more months to maybe make up for some lost time to yep. to potentially correct some decisions. Whereas you know some people might be taken like that and never have the opportunity to to finish things off the maybe maybe the way they wanted. And we're back, but yeah. I don't know how anybody would. Uh, I think this is what I was saying before the the commercial. The, break. the commercial break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Who who are your sponsors? Have yeah. you gotten any? Yet? Yeah. Um, Vizzy, thank you. No, I have no. I don't have a single sponsor. I am trying to get Vizzy. 
What is Vizzy? It's um, it's. I don't even know why it started this way, but it's like um, it's like a white claw, but it has vitamin C in it, so it's healthy. Hell yeah, dude! I'm all about <laughs> I'm all about the seltzers, man. Like they're just they're just punching their way up through the market right now. Yeah. Like, I was over at the neighbor's house the other day, and he's you know a good old country boy, and he's like, I got some Miller Lite for you if you want. I was like, do you I have brought any, some. Do you have any seltzer? truly? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm a I'm a man too. Yeah, I am. So. I'm, I'm a man. <laughs> bum, bum, yeah. No, I'm the milk part of the, the milk and bourbon piece. So yeah, a, I'm the bourbon. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, uh, I can't. Oh, if you live in the the fact that like life's gonna end all the time, try to think and do that. Do anything else while you're thinking about that. Like I, I don't know that the human mind can can constantly be thinking about its own mortality and then like. Oh, get Accomplish up. anything. Yeah. Brush yeah. your teeth in the morning. Yeah. Do this. You know, do like, this mundane task yeah. that means nothing. So I think probably by design we uh, don't live in that mind space all the time. Or at least you know normal. I feel like it'd be, people like it'd us. be pretty unhealthy. I think to I just like constantly be obsessed with your own mortality. How would you not go into depression all the time uh-huh. and like just to become a total like you know phobic of everything? Like, yeah. That's gonna kill me. That's gonna kill me. Like, that's that's a tough place to live. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that. I'm glad that I don't have... I'm glad that I get caught up in the minutia of my daily life and don't think about, like... I couldn't be Plato, I don't think. Or, or Socrates. Not only because yeah. I'm not smart enough, but, like, also because... Like, how do they even... Get, yeah. Like, how did they How did they make money, man? Like, wow. Those guys had to be... Like, we look at them now with, like, such reverence. In their own time, people had to be like, those dudes are fucking weird. You like you know, they didn't have normal relationships. No, like because they were so they were so much on a different plane. They could never just be like, "Oh man, I gotta tell you." They're like, can you picture them like drinking mead or something? Yeah, or whatever the what whatever the alcoholic beverage of the time was. I guess wine. Sure, maybe drink wine. They had like a. Tubbies. They had like some sort of like honey based beer too, mm. or equivalent to beer, which yeah. I think I tried once and it wasn't good. So. So they're sitting there drinking their shitty beers, right? Yeah. And they're just like, the wife won't leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like, you know what would make this beer even better? Is if I did two of them and I put them in a funnel <laughs> to go into my mouth. That would be legit, right? And they're like, let's try it. Like Aristotle's like, gang. Like, yeah, I just don't, yeah. I don't see, I feel like they just didn't, there, there was nothing normal about their day to day. But I feel like. Those guys, even those guys had to take a shit. Yeah, but they were thinking about the cosmos. No, while they were you taking... can't. T- there's no way. Maybe while they were doing it, but like when they were like, all of a sudden the urge to shit had to come on, and they weren't anywhere near the bathroom or wherever they were going. Oh yeah, it was like, only they, it was only shit on their. Yeah, brains. that man. That's, that's some things rush right to the top. That's panic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not. They're not like thinking about the stars. There's or no bathhouses around here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. <laughs> that, that has to be it. Oh man. Well, at the shit for brains comment, I feel like yeah, you got to bring it back down. We uh, we get back to the final portion of this book is me rating it. Nine million copies sold at the time that this book was printed, so it's got some worldliness to it, um, and that's I'm assuming just in English. So if you if you think about it, like widely applicable, um, I think it's got something for everyone, like. There's obviously people that draw lessons learned from seeing other people's stories, and there's people that like reading about like psychotherapy or, or psychoanalysis or stuff like that, which is something that I've picked up recently. Um, real heavy, actually. Uh, I mentioned, I think, in a podcast or two ago that my science and tech became just basically like psychoanalysis or something to do with the brain. Hmm. Um, I'm going to give it... Don't feel pressure to give it higher just because I'm standing here. Yeah, he's the one that gave, he's the one that gave me the book. You, what's your, what do you, what would you rate it? I don't. It's hard for me to say because like if I, you're a tough grader, like I'm way more of liberal of a grader. I, I, someone told me that they went out and got that first book, the the Gucci Main Guide to Greatness, which I had given three out of first review. I had given three out of five stars initially, and so he went out and got it, and he was like, "That book was dog shit. Why did you tell me?" No kidding. Yeah, so I, I vowed to him that I'd be tougher from there on out. So I, I, I did a restructuring and everything. Okay. Um, 
See, I don't know how I would do it on your on your well, uh, you. rating scale. Man, I have five. This, out of five, this is a five for me. Like this is probably a must read. One of three or four of the the core books in my life that I've read and reread a few times because I think it has that much value. So I'd, I'd have to give it a five. On okay. Scale. Okay. I'm going to give it a four. And I think there's only one book that I rated above a four and it's just purely because of like the artistry of it. It was an incredible storyteller. Um, but I agree with you that this has some lessons in it. Um, and I mean, we just broad stroked it. And it's like um, just reading through like some of the experiences he had, and I feel like he intentionally didn't include the worst of it. Yeah, this was not like other like. There's plenty of Holocaust books out there that are purely just like a biographical about the experiences of him, and he touches on some there that yeah. like check with the with the rest of those. But he 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 only uses particular ones as a vessel to get a particular point across. Yeah, like it's not the the main substance of his book. He never gets gory or anything, and he never gets like morbid, really, mm-hmm. with it. There are times where he like, and it's almost flippant the way he says it. he's like, "Oh yeah," and they they had us crushing big rocks into little rocks for six days straight or something like, yeah. Just and and he passes over it so easily. Like actually, when they got liberated, he kind of said it in a very like observational, matter of fact tone. Like, yeah, like I just watched this. I just watched this American soldier walk up from like. Mm-hmm. a couple hundred meters away and it just kind of ended yeah like, it was weird yeah and then he talks about like the logistics of getting them out of there but mm-hmm. yeah i'm gonna give it four out of five stars just looping back around um there are some valuable lessons i think it's a good a good way to like adjust your own thinking because i think a lot of people do prescribe to like whether they like to admit it or not the freud and the and the jung way of thinking where like there's you're you're looking for pleasure or happiness out of life i feel like that's salient i think everyone thinks that like Mm -hmm. our point here is to be happy and i've said this before it's i don't seek even before i read this it's not that you seek happiness because happiness is so fleeting Mm -hmm. you seek contentedness like you, you want to be content you want to have a small like beautiful things mm-hmm. that you can rely on, whether it's a relationship, yeah. so that experiential or, or your craft, which is that creative, or just the way you respond to things and how you leave that legacy for your family to follow, which I guess is the attitudinal. Like seeking happiness is a very dangerous game, mm-hmm. but seeking meaning I think is very concrete. Yeah. And so yeah, it, it's a good adjustment I think. So yeah, I'll give it four out of five stars. Back, dude. Begrudgingly, <laughs> I was gonna say if Gucci Man got more than well, Victor, I, 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 I draw <laughs> no no disrespect to the main, but yeah. come on, <laughs> yeah, he's brilliant. For the bourbon portion, I Nick isn't much of a drinker. Um, Nick Ataldo, Nick Rogers, totally different story. Besides seltzer, that's yeah. That's my so so like <laughs> if if we had done bourbon, Nick would have been like, I feel like I and this is probably making this oversimplifying this but i feel like nick would have drank it swirled it around and been like yep that's bourbon and like put it down like that's 100 percent what i would have done yeah out of respect for your show yeah and the style of your show and respect for you like i would have drank it wouldn't have liked it no i hope you enjoyed this chat with my best friend um 13 years running um i hope you enjoyed watching us crush ourselves in that um workout and then um Feel free to, if you've read this book, it's a pretty common book, I guess, um, as far as people having read it. My dad read it, and he said that he loved the book as well. Um, So give me your thoughts on it. If you think there are other books that are like it that you'd want me to review in the future, of course, do that as well. But appreciate you, Nick, for coming on. Hey, brother. Thanks for having me. It's really an honor. Let's go get drunk. What? Yeah, let's (laughs) have a drink anyway. Just off the show. All right. I had a great time talking with Nick, and I always really do. Um, <clears throat> every time we get together, he he always kind of, he's a serious man. Um, he, he will joke sometimes, but more often than I ever am, he's serious. And I always, 
I always like having that balance amongst my friend group. And I've got the one side where it's Adam and Vince and Nick Mason, and they're funny people, very humorous, and they can be serious sometimes. And then there's people like Nick Cataldo, also funny, but he picks and chooses more often uh, where he throws in the humor and as a baseline is a more serious person. And so I can always count on having like a, a really nice, serious conversation with him. But again, Nick Cataldo, thank you for, for coming on. Next time I will get you to try the bourbon with me, but um, didn't want to throw it on you. But now that I know that you're, you're game to try it, I'll, I'll make sure you back that up. So for head buzz, I actually struggled a little bit because there were a couple different things that I wanted to talk about, and I ended up with a brain-related topic yet again. Uh, but this one's kind of a societal issue in general and can be drilled down to the individual if you so choose. But as a society, and not just American society, but as a, a human collective, it's been found that over the last <clears throat> 26, 27 years, our IQ, our average IQ across all generations has dropped so that when they take the intelligence quotient from octogenarians, obviously like they're starting to lose some of their capacity, I guess, for displaying their intelligence, but it's showing that even the younger generations, sorry, Gen Z, y'all think you're so funny, so humorous, but it turns out on average, your IQs are lower. So deal with that. That's the ultimate joke, but it's been happening since like 95. That was, the last time the IQ, general average IQ, had gone up was in 1995. And that had been continuing from 1919, I think, when the the measurement for IQ, intelligence quotient, was made. So it had been in increasing every single year that it had been taken until 1995. And then uh, I think they said it was dropping 0.7 points per year. So or something similar to the point where now a whole generation, if you're a generation separate separate from somebody, you're probably somewhere around 12 intelligence quotient points lower. And this is according to BBC Future. Um, one of their sub-indexes called uh, Something Civilization. It's actually really cool. It's got a lot of different broad concepts in this, in this subfolder, but... It mentions Australopithecus, which had like a 400 cubic centimeter um, brain capacity. So the like the the hollow part of your skull for an Australopithecus was 400 uh, average 400 cubic centimeters. Whereas um, later on, they obviously like continue to grow to the point where 20% uh, of our caloric intake is actually from brain function in modern day humans. But another interesting thing is that Neanderthals actually had a slightly larger skull on average. And I've got this theory that despite them being smarter, they had less of a capacity for violence. And it was actually like Homo erectus that because of their propensity for violence either absorbed Neanderthals, which if you looked at my my 23 and me states that I have more Neanderthal genes than roughly 70% of the tested population. So, um, and it's something like 2%, maybe even less of DNA traits that can be s traced directly to Neanderthals. But either way, I have a theory that Homo erectus was just more violent than Homo Neanderthalus Neanderthal. And there was a little bit of interbreeding, but for the most part, we just killed them because we had more guile, which is um, not a proud point for me, but that's just something that I believe, and I believe other people have posited that in a couple different books. So we're, we're now at 1,300 cubic centimeters as a brain capacity, and our intelligence quotient had gone up every year for about 76 years and then over the past 26 now 
it's dropped a little bit every single year. And the argument is that even if that is true, intelligence quotient is a really good way of measuring abstract, the ability to handle abstract topics, which we're, we were getting better at because of things like computer use. Because if you think about it, all computer use is just an abstract version of what you're actually, actually functioning, functioningly doing. But IQ doesn't directly correlate to actually making better decisions was what this article went on to say. So someone with the intelligence quotient of like 140 still succumbs to some of our cognitive biases. So things like um, confirmation bias, people going into an argument well, into research, really. When people go into research and they only search for facts that further deepen their belief and the validity of their belief, I guess, is the better way to say this. And then there's the framing bias where instead of saying 95% fat-free, if, if someone would put on their packaging 5% fat, it looks worse when it says 5% fat as opposed to 95% 90 fat-free. Um there's sunk cost bias, the tendency to throw more into something that you can already tell is a losing project. I experienced that when I was first investing. I think everyone's kind of experienced something similar to that. Um, we're no better at temporal discounting. So that marshmallow test, I've mentioned it before, but it's just an easy reference point. The smarter you are doesn't actually as far as IQ goes, your abstract, your ability to handle abstract thought or um, that general intelligence does not help you with the rationale of temporal discounting, which is you can have the small good thing immediately or you can wait and have something doubly as good or doubly as satisfying. And people have a very tough time delaying that gratification so whether your IQ is 140, 150, you're even higher, or if it's 70, um, I don't think there's a lot of difference in how some of those people make their decisions because of our cognitive biases. So the argument is that our IQ has gone up for a century, and now it's dropping, but is that necessarily a terrible thing with rational decision-making? Maybe not. Does it still hurt to know that as a species that our IQ is going down? Yes, absolutely. But is it as big of a deal um, if we're socially aware and are able to function in groups by learning from our history? I think that's where humankind can make the biggest strides is putting more credence in history and lessons learned from that history. So I think there's a lot to be learned from knowing that it's not just the IQ, intelligence quotient that's going to determine your success as a human being. It's, it's more of your ability to socially maneuver because no one gets, and this is something that I saw recently with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was saying that it's bullshit for people that call themselves self-made in, in the vast majority of cases there's been a multitude of people that have helped you get to where you're getting or have gotten. So for you to say you're self-made is kind of, I've been stuck on this egotistical vibe recently. I used to um, say that the most sought after trait that I had in, in a partner was their intelligence. And then I went through a situation where I realized intelligence is great, but kindness is even cooler. And so I've started trying to be that person where, I'm more thoughtful and more kind. And that's because I'm seeking that um, in other people that I surround myself not with, not just with romantic relationships, but really just any relationship. I, I value kindness, loyalty, honesty more than I do intelligence now. Whereas at one point it was the only thing in its own category above everything else as far as who I spent my time with, um, either on a platonic or, or other level. So I think there's more to, 
to life than just being really smart. It's what you do as, cause we're the only reason our brains even grew to this level is because we were supposed to be able to function in large groups until the agrarian lifestyle came about as hunter gatherers. We were collecting up to like 150 people. And in fact, if you really think about it, um, even today, and I, I read this in another book that I can't recall right now, but it's our friend group isn't really much larger that, than that to this day. There's like a critical mass that our friend group can reach. Um, friends and family, just people that we maintain close relationships with, it's still hanging around 150. That hasn't changed. It's just we're just surrounded by more people, but we don't know them. We know nothing about them. They don't factor into our lives. So I think we're social creatures and we need to focus on being socially responsible and, and kind. And that would get us a lot further than a few uh, intelligent quotients, intelligence quotient points. So that's my head buzz. We're getting dumber, but it's not the end of the world. Not yet, at least. On to bourbon. So today I was originally going to go with a bourbon called Old Granddad. But I was talked out of it by my dad because... Um, in a couple of podcasts, him and I are going to do a double blind test between Old Granddad and Basil Hayden because they're made from the same sour mash bill, which is really the baseline flavor profile for the bourbon. And so the for the fact that they're the same mash bill, it got really interesting to me because the Old Granddad is thirty around 30 bucks cheaper than the Basil Hayden. And they have the same flavor profile. So I'm I'm really interested to see if we can discern which one's which. Um, and I think these are the things that I was originally setting out to do with this podcast, was giving people information that would drive their spending habits. So I'm definitely going to hit that. So this bourbon is Eagle Rare. Um... On its nose, it's got complex aromas of toffee, hints of orange peel, herbs, honey, leather, and oak. Um, I've read this leather thing in bourbons before, and I'm always kind of turned off by it. So that part always is odd to me. Um, I think maybe it's just one of those things where they try to make it interesting and um, let it ride, I guess. But for the taste, it's bold, dry, oaky flavors with notes of candied almonds and very rich cocoa. I don't mind candied almonds, and I definitely don't mind anything cocoa-based. And then its finish is dry and lingering. So, every time I've tried Eagle Rare in the past, I've enjoyed it. What I'm worried about is that I've started picking up bourbons recently that I used to know that I liked. And since I've actually really started paying attention to the flavor profiles and comparing them to others and the fact that I'm lumping them in with some like really expensive bourbons, like the rhetoric 24 year or was it 23 year? I think it was 23 year. Like that's not a cheap bourbon. And yet I'm comparing it to $30 bourbons. So I think I'm, I'm overly harsh, but um, I think things will start shaking out the more I do this and as I build up this data set, the statistics will start shaking out and there'll be a little bit of a bell curve as far as rankings go. And you'll be able to make, over time, really good decisions based off of my idea of what's good. So it's, it is definitely, that's that's the issue here is that it's my take on it and everyone's palate is different. So it's it's up to you guys, but interested in the taste. The nose doesn't super excite me, but first sip. Here we go.
I don't know. <laughs> it, uh, one more. This just seems like a run-of-the-mill bourbon. Nothing wrong with run-of-the-mill bourbon. I, I There's a place for every bourbon in my life. I'm just wondering if it's got anything distinct about it. Like, what makes it different from... And I think this was my, my major issue with 1792 as well. Was, um... Where's, this, where's the distinct flavors? What makes it different? Why am I choosing this product over another one? And I can't answer that rightly with this one. It's... It's a bourbon. It doesn't taste bad. It's not absolutely flavorless like 1792, so I wouldn't even say it. I, I shouldn't have even compared the two. I feel bad. Sorry, Eagle Rare and everyone that's put their livelihoods and lives into making this. I'm not trying to be rude. This is just my take on it. I'm going to give it another pour because I feel like I have to give it another shot. I'm just not super overwhelmed by anything about it. And, and I've said this before, too. There are days where I'm ready to receive the bourbon. It's, I'm ready. Please. Thank you. Thank you. This is exactly what I needed. And then there are days, like today, <laughs> where, I don't know, I just, you got to be in a certain mood. But here we go. One more shot at it. I mean, I get the dry, the dry through the whole, the smell is kind of dry, the the taste, the palate is, is dry, and then man, it finishes dry hard as hell. One thing that I picked up on the second one, I got the honey scent way more on this pool than the first one, and then I got the oaky flavor, which I mean, that's that's kind of what made bourbon what it is is the huge difference between and I, like i said i've already started reading that bourbon book what started setting some of those bourbons apart back then were a couple different things it was the mash bill and it was the charred oak because not everyone did that all the time there used to be a practice where they would give it to wholesalers and the wholesalers would add prune juice there was even cases of like throwing tobacco spit into these bourbon barrels to give them color which i guess was more it, it set them apart from the ver from the the vodkas and the and the white rums and the the blanco tequilas but i mean at the time rum was very popular so i guess it was trying to go after the rum look but yeah, this was before they started standardizing what bourbon's all about. So I'm going to stop blabbering about bourbon. I'm going to give it a, a 2 out of 5. I wasn't overly impressed by anything about it. Um, and I guess what I'm starting to do with my ratings is... Would I seek this product out when I went into a store? Is this going to be the first thing on my mind? And Eagle Rare is not it. So, I'm not saying don't buy it. I think if I were giving it a 1 or a 1 1.5, that's, that's the ones where you're just like, I'm wasting my money. But if it's there, and Long Branch isn't there, didn't go for it, yeah. But, um, yet another podcast done. I wanted to thank Nick Cataldo yet again. Um, he's been watching or listening. I think he's been one of the listeners on Spotify um, to every single podcast. And I always appreciate those people that are, are still with me, giving me feedback. Um, another another shout out to, to Trustin. Uh, my cousin Trustin, he he's been really positive with the feedback, um, 
and not just like blowing smoke up my ass, but also giving me like really good pointers on things that I can improve on. So thank you, Trustin, for that. Um, I appreciate that. So thank you guys for sticking with me. Um, and this one is always, damn the man that can't do it. Love you guys.